Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Cybersecurity and Data Security, Auditing at a Speed of Crime. My name is Pascal van den Bush. I am Secretary General of ECIA, and maybe for those who do not know about ECIA, so ECIA is the European Confederation of Institute of Internal Auditors, represented 34 national institutes, and about 50,000 internal auditors. Our main, our main activity is advocacy towards the European regulator about the internal audit profession, but also good and strong corporate governance. Cyber risk is part of our daily life nowadays, and I think I may say that now most companies have understood that this is not just an IT risk, but it's much more, it's a business risk. And even board members are now watching what's going on on the cyber risk side. As internal auditors, we do have a very important role to play to mitigate this risk the best that we can. And this is the topic for the webinar today. So let me please start with some logistic details. We will use Slido to facilitate the discussion in terms of polls, but also for the Q&A at the end of the webinar, where you can raise all the questions that you would like to the panelists. We will also use Slido for the CPE request form, and it will be open until the end of the day today, so you have time to fill in this document. So now it's time to start the discussion and to thank our panelists that have found some time to share with you their best practices about cyber. The facilitator for today's discussion will be Guy Goldstein. He is currently lecturer on, on cyber power at the French School of Economy Warfare. He's also an advisor for PwC and has a very strong experience in cybersecurity and helping internal auditor through the National French Institute, IFASI. So, Guy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pascal, and delighted to be with all of you uh, on this uh, lunchtime slash afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, indeed, uh, I'll be happy and delighted to moderate today's webinar on uh, cyber risk. Uh, just to, to understand a bit of a background, uh, this webinar has actually been organized following a risk in focus roundtable on cyber risk uh, that was set a few weeks ago. And, uh, and to be even more precise, and we'll get then into uh, the details of what we're going to discuss about, the conversation was organized around the key prescription on cyber risk detailed in the latest 2023 risk in focus document called hot topics for internal auditors and well indeed uh, you could tell that you know as was mentioned by uh, pascal uh, cyber risk is definitely a real hot topic and again i you know beside all that i can think about and my personal bias on the on the topic i'll go back to what is actually explained in the document, a hot topic for internal auditors, that cyber security, and I quote, cyber security and data security uh, retain its hold this year as the number one threat in the risk in focus 2023 survey. I stress that uh, with 82% of uh, uh, respondents saying it was a top five risk, about the same as uh, uh, previous year. Uh, so indeed, a critical, critical element of actually your activity as an auditor, an internal controller. Uh, so then to speak about it and, and to really give it the view from the auditors and from the third line of defense, which is really the logic, the approach of what we try to do, because it's not a conversation, on cyber, it's not an you know, conversation on cybersecurity that you could have with CISO, this is really for us, you, uh, internal auditors uh, and controllers. Um, well, for that, uh, I have a great chance and privilege uh, to have uh, with us three auditors uh, that actually took part in the previous roundtable I mentioned. Uh, first, Sabine Scholz, who is Senior Vice President uh, for Group Audit at Fresenius, 
It's a publicly listed company. Uh, then also Bern Banker, who is the head of corporate audit information technology at BMW, of a publicly listed company. Uh, and then uh, Jérôme Ferry, who is vice president corporate audit at Furnish um, in France, I believe. Uh, all of you, uh, I assume that uh, now you should be uh, online uh, with uh, all the cameras on. Um, and I will start actually uh, by going, uh, as mentioned, uh, with all the prescriptions that have been established by uh, this hot, doc um, hot Topics for Internal Auditors document. And actually, to go back to the, the last part of the document, how audit can help the organization with regards to cyber risks. And here we actually have a few uh, key prescriptions. And actually, I'll start with the first one that I'll read, which is the need to assess whether the organization has effective and timely mechanisms in place to spread information on new cyber threats countermeasures and advice throughout the business. So indeed, a key first uh, prescription with regards to communication. And well, then to engage into a conversation, I would like to start, I uh, would like to start with perhaps Sabine, uh, if you had a few views from your own personal mm -hmm. experience, from your approach, from what you've seen, on what is the best you know, elements um, approach to indeed uh, have this effective and timely mechanism to spread information on your cyber threats and countermeasures. Uh, happy to listen to you, Sabina. <laughs> Hello uh, to the group here. Uh, thank you very much, Guy. Um, that's a really that's the key, I would say, in that audit. What you can do as an uh, internal auditor, and it's very broad. So let's make two, three points to that. Firstly, if you look around about what you should expect, what a company should do, you find quite a lot of, um, we call it as auditors, the criteria, right? Standards where you can follow. And from my perspective, firstly, when uh, we did that, um, used uh, standards like NIST, BSE, or whatever your government in your, uh, in your country is offering to give a thought what should be done in a company. So it's not my personal uh, 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 development. So we started in order to think what we have there uh, in order to assess and have a good um, list against what we would like to um, to do that. And they are quite good of uh, standards. Second point, what I would say is uh, if you ask me that question five years ago, it was quite different because five years ago we might have from the maturity in our organization we were not at the status what we are currently means in order if you would like to assess that you even have to recognize where are you and from my personal perspective i can tell you in the very beginning five years ago we assessed indeed in that we um, already had to say do we have a risk and then we are coming up with some of these measures you should do like vulnerability scan you're going across um, and looking and saying how vulnerable is your whole system. So that would be if your maturity model, if your organization is not really grown so far, I would say that would be one of the first steps. If your organization is growing and you see what you have, and now let's come to the second, third point about that. Uh, you were just talking about the third line, right? Um, uh, let's look on what is with the first and the second line. And what we did here is that we have seen in the last five years that the sort of second line, a cyber risk organization was growing and taking some of the tasks which were earlier in the first line. Means when I'm assessing that, I'm going in the organization, make a good analysis what we have there. And then especially with cyber risk, I think uh, it's a very clear focus on how fast is the organization in order to de detect these attacks, what you have, and then communicate it in the um, uh, situation. That is very easy to assess on that part. You just need to ask, you know, um, do you know precisely where are your systems? Where are the people sitting to whom you have contact to? Can you give me a response? And make some example, you know, in the very beginning when you send out an email and saying the system ABC is threatened, yeah, maybe take another firewall, make a patch. Then the reaction time was between 24 hours and three weeks. 
And what we were looking at and saying, you know, it seems that your organization is not well set up. Um, foster that. It means in the moment you have threats, the reaction time, you could look at how fast you are and do you already have a good overview about the systems. If you have this uh, last question part, I think it was a little bit more preventive is how if you have the experience and you are learning from it, how can you enhance or is the organization enhancing that knowledge what you have seen means how can the organization learn what they have for uh, trainings and how they are getting the people in order to respond to that. That are in our um, form, I would say, um, important things and whatever what I said in the very beginning criteria, look at these standards, what you see, and then you have very good um, topics in sort of how the organization is set up should be and on the other side, how the processes should be. Guy, make that um, a little bit clearer, maybe yeah. So if, if, if I rephrase very quickly yeah. your other the important elements, one maybe I would highlight because you do stress something which is important, which is the need for speed. Whenever you know you have this type of station, is this ability, as I understand, to properly map uh, the IT assets and then the people and the elements and the people actually in the production lines, I guess, so that yes. your know, this element of communication, the right message goes to the right person as quickly as possible. Is that correct? It's correct, Guy. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So here's actually a question to the audience. Uh, now you can go into Slido. Uh, uh, and I, I guess it's very easy to use, I'm sure. Uh, and, and, and the question is actually right there. Uh, that goes back to actually uh, uh, what we started to uh, chat about uh, Sabine, which is how indeed uh, is this uh, uh, mapping of IT sets between uh, the IT assets and the people, the production, the service lines. You know, one of the critical elements you actually uh, just mentioned, uh, Sabina. As people continue to uh, play with Slido, uh, which is, I'm sure is, is quite fun, uh, I will move into actually Bernd. Uh, and, and, and again, in this question of uh, communication, perhaps you know, you know how big and spread it should be, and especially what should happen at time of crisis, for example. Yeah, so also good afternoon from my side. Um, many thanks. Um, I think one important thing is mentioned within the slide, so the IT assets. And um, I think uh, it is very important in the end um, that you know your um, all your IT assets, so that you know them very well, that they are described, and of course, they are also mapped in a, a proper way. And um, this means to have a complete picture in terms of uh, breadth and depth um, regarding maybe a more technical description. So thinking of configuration management or what is also quite important, um, software bill of material. And of course, which is very important, the mapping to the business units and responsible persons, departments. And um, well, understandingly, this is not um, too easy as um, parts of the IT assets uh, are not only in the responsibility of an IT department or a central IT department, but um, also in the responsibility of uh, business departments. So having, for example, new technologies like uh, no-code, low-code um, applications in mind, or also software as a service. So um, it will be a increasing topic. And um, so it's really important uh, to have really an overview about the IT assets. And I think a very good example for this was the Log4J vulnerability end of last yes. year. And it has shown that it was really, really important to have this holistic view. So as complete as possible in the end, also to be able to contact the responsible persons in a timely manner. And especially in, yeah, it was only vulnerability, but I think it has a character of a, maybe of a crisis that uh, war rooms could be required so that you have um, a defined list of colleagues to share directly or indirectly all the information that is, let's say, up and running. And um, so to be able um, to cascade the information outside uh, to the right persons or also maybe uh, in parallel for the security operations center to contact as quickly as possible the, the right persons. And um, 
And in the end, to really react in a timely manner, um, it is, let's say, dependent, highly dependent on the quality of this um, yeah, mentioned holistic picture. All right. So if, if I understand correctly, A, as you mentioned, you know, the, the right depth and breadth to get that holistic picture so that, again, you're able to do that proper mapping between IT assets and, and people and their business responsibilities. OK, yep. and then. As, as you said, you know, rephrase and, and stop me if I'm wrong, uh, then during time of crisis, that important tool that can be the war room, but the war room, which is also, as I understand, an element of communication so that you have what you mentioned, the defined list of people with whom you can then out of the war room correctly send the right information and then cascade the information to whom it is, you know, need to, to get through. That, that, that's, that, that's correct. Yeah, that's that's correct. So in the end, if you have this picture, then all the relevant information are available. And because um, in the case of such a, a crisis, speed is very, very important. And if you first um, think about who is the contact person, which IT system is um, impacted by vulnerability, you lose a lot of time. Right. And you, you're quite right. And thanks for that to really stress on the importance of, of speed indeed the real definition of a crisis and the real problems not to be overwhelmed by problems and thus to be as quick as the situation. Um, so this is very important. Thanks again, uh, Bernd, for, for those elements at time of crisis. Now, actually, I would switch to not time of crisis, all right? What do we do when things supposedly are okay, but we all know, of course, that they are not? And for that, I, I would like to actually uh, ask uh, uh, Jérôme, uh, you know, what should be the proper ways, you know, for this, for information to be spread, uh, to be communicated on cyber risk, not when you're a crisis, you know, and how do we do about that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Guy, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yes, you're, you're right. Oh, I fully agree with what has been uh, already said by my uh, two peers here uh, supporting me in this uh, in this webinar. Well, what is also uh, important to uh, to me is having this ongoing communication around uh, cybersecurity, not only during crisis. Uh, it's, it's all about sharing the knowledge and having the whole organization fully aware of the potential risk. You may have all the uh, processes in place, the firewalls and whatever, if you have one guy in the organization just clicking on the wrong email, and then you would be in trouble. So this is why I consider this aspect of assessing as an auditor what is the framework in place to communicate regularly around those topics. And this could be through many different uh, means, could be through the intranet, through email, through forums, uh, and could be using as well result of phishing campaign or uh, the root cause analysis of the past event, unfortunately, which uh, which uh, expose the organization to cyber attacks. So this is critical. And to do that on, on really a, a periodic basis, to me, it's something which is very important because the cyber security risk is also driven by uh, the people behavior, right? Anyone in the organization has a key role to play. So having this constant uh, communication is something which, which to me is is important, and uh, that's what I would like to uh, to stress uh, and to uh, come with a proposal to to uh, to you and to uh, to answer this question. So I, I get it, and I, I agree, of course, uh, stress the point of having continuous communication. Is there also a need so beyond what may be say general, perhaps? And, and you refer, please feel free to rephrase, of course, if I say things that, you know, out of place. But beyond the, the need for uh, your uh, ongoing regular communications, you know, that could go in many different ways, say intranet, emails and so forth. Is there also a need for like specific, say, campaigns, specific moments, specific perhaps little surprises uh, or, or, or elements of test for the general population of, uh, of, of the company? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point as well. Um, I think every one of us, and especially corporate audit, could contribute also uh, and be uh, uh, an active uh, member in sharing this information and taking those good examples. So uh, taking my own uh, uh, experiences on this, 
Um, and, and that's also aligned with the with the three uh, line model where you have arrows between the first, second and third line. What we try to do in coordination with our CISO is during our opening meeting to also spread and share the good information and some good examples, right? So that we can also um, provide this knowledge to maybe affiliates which are our uh, local teams which are a little bit uh, alone or far from the corporate and the headquarters. So that's also it's it's a bit every everyone in the organization which can contribute to this uh, uh, to this knowledge uh, dissemination and especially corporate to do. I, I hope I answered your question correctly. Absolutely, absolutely. All that makes sense. So again, you know, if I try to rephrase, we had the general principle given by Sabine and among things, the, the necessity to map uh, uh, IT assets to actually people process business processes. Let's be very clear on that. Uh, then with, with Bernd, we, we discuss again the importance of having this holistic view and what happens during crisis. And then uh, with you, Jerome, we kind of try to dig deeper into when we don't have crisis and hopefully we don't have crisis all the time, but still what we need to do in terms of uh, in terms of a general communication and quite right to have this general uh, learning across the organization of what's at stake. So now if I go back to the questions uh, we asked, which was based actually on the, the, the principle uh, stated by Sabine, uh, how well does the organization map IT assets and people production of service lines? So we do have uh, on the screen what seems to be a very nice Gaussian uh, curve which may follow, you know, a normal law, perhaps. I don't know. That could be my in personal interpretation. Uh, I don't know what what would be your, your take. And, and feel free, either Sabine, Bernd or Jerome, to, to react to what seems to be appearing on, on the screen. Um, so yes, maybe Sabine. I say something. I, I think, oh, um, yes, it, it, it underlines that um, it seems not to be um, too easy in the end to uh, to create this um, holistic overview and, and link the IT assets um, to, let's say, people production and the service lines um, to exactly know who is using an IT application, who would be the responsible person that um, it is a challenge. And um, I think um, this, this underlines this, yes. Right. Yeah, very good. I even, we are now in 2022, right? And I think 50% uh, is already, the, you are quite good about that. If we have uh, would have asked the question three years ago, I'm quite sure we would be less than 25% because that is really together we IT departments or however you call that, that is really challenged to get that through because, and Guy, uh, you already mentioned that, it's not only the IT department, you have the production side. They have, uh, how can I say, um, uh, um, uh, 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 they are linked to internet as well, but not really managed by the IT, typical IT guys. So it's production side wise. So I think 50% is already good. And um, I think getting there to 80, 90 percent where we should have it, you will need some, I would say, years in order to get that really done in that details. But 50 percent, 22, I would say quite good, quite good. Okay. Well, let's put it that. I myself maybe a little more uh, pessimistic on that because whoever, you know, maybe following a normal curve. Uh, but at any rate, you're right. We need to shift actually this bulk into the uh, later part, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, right, now let's move to the second question because time's running um, and we'll get to that. So I, again, I go back to the prescriptions which were given in, in the Hot Topic document, which was assess whether the board has a firm grasp on the business risk, uh, cyber data and data security posed to the organization strategy. So now we're really going into the board situation uh, and you do have this question with, with people that can still play evidently with a slider game, which is how well does your board discuss cyber risk, evidently. Um, and, and, and to engage into a conversation, maybe I would point out, I would ask uh, Bernd, uh, you know, how do you actually engage mentally, with what do you engage mentally a board? What does a board like? 
Well, um, I think in the end um, that the board or the, the top management is able to, um, let's say, discuss the, the cyber risks and have, let's say, a, a good impression of the situation. I think re reporting is, is quite an important component. And um, I think was, um, let's say, uh, matters to the senior top management is um, often, of course, to provide it figures and, and trends. And um, this is quite often uh, to be proven as, as key. So um, ideally, um, the numbers, of course, on the one side are linked to um, incidents, potential damages to the business services. And um, regarding cyber risks, I think convincing examples are quite helpful to illustrate um, the current um, threat risk situation and to underline the key messages. But on the other side, of course, uh, the reporting should also be linked to the IT security level um, of the, the company. So considering um, the current um, threat situation, which of course change from time to time, and the risk situation, and on the other side, of course, the implementation status of, of protection measures. And um, this um, KPI figures, of course, uh, need to be thought through very carefully because um, it's not too easy to put all these messages um, in, in figures. So um, the KPIs must be pertinent, so covering all relevant aspects, and they should be, of course, meaningful and um, should be not too much, so meaning belonging to a small set and, of course, ideally covering nearly holistically um, the needs of the, of the top management. And um, of course, ultimately, they should be linked to the evaluation to the to the business risks. And of course, it's also important to review how the management understands and processes this information on the cyber risks. In the end, also to re, um, which they receive. Um, in the end, to be able to verify um, the effectiveness of the reporting. And on the other side, of course, also to identify um, need for action or amendment of the reporting uh, to be sure that there is no gap and um, that um, the right information is, um, let's say, um, transported to the to the top management. Yeah, well, so again, the importance when you mentioned the importance of figures and trends, because that's, I guess, what board members actually get. Uh, the ability, as you said, uh, that uh, uh, all that needs to be thought through, not any figures, evidently not any numbers, and that, if I may rephrase, it needs to be messy, you know, mutually exclusive, completely exhaustive, and simple, because, of course, your board members, they will think about cyber, which is, by the way, the top number one risk today, unstated, you know, by document, but still many other things to do. Uh, got it. Thanks a lot, Ben. Though maybe if we move into, you know, how often, how do we speak, what forum, fora do we speak about that? You know, what should be, again, the right uh, patterns of communications to the board with, with right organization? That may be a question uh, for you, Jérôme, uh, if that's okay with you. Yes, for sure, with pleasure, uh, Guy. Um, I think for many years now, if we have a look simply on the risk in focus, right, cybersecurity is maybe one of the top risks for, for many, many years. So I'm I'm pretty convinced that everyone attending this webinar have on their risk map somewhere the cybersecurity. So that should be something which would be, uh, I would say, asked by the audit committee or by the board to review regularly. I, I, I do uh, expect that the, the, this key risk has been assigned to a kind of risk sponsor, risk owner, call it as you want. I think what could be a good practice is to have this risk sponsor um, uh, providing uh, at least annual uh, update to the board or to the audit committee on how the organization is 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 uh, performing in the in the mitigation of the cybersecurity. Where are we in the status of the implementation of the action linked to the uh, the mitigation action linked to the cybersecurity? So I think that could be a good practice. Now, also as uh, internal audit, we need to build a, a risk-based audit plan, right? So I would imagine, I would expect that we have to include in our audit plan areas where uh, we need to provide assurance on the on the mitigation of cybersecurity risk. So it's another mean to regularly come back 
through the audit committee or through the board as a corporate auditor and providing them some good insight on how the organization is performing on this uh, on this topic. So could be done by more the risk sponsor by the second line, but of course as a corporate audit team we have a we have a key role to play. And this depending on the on the frequency, the periodicity of our meeting with with the chair of the audit committee, with the board, that's something I would imagine is is using the right KPI as as Bernd was explaining uh, truly before. It's it's something which is definitely in the scope of corporate audit. Got it. So we have the KPIs, we have the uh, the frequency and the right forum either through the responsor or perhaps some ad hoc committees or uh, the review uh, via the audit committee the perhaps on a quarterly review whatnot so i have elements with how does that make it an overall system right so that would be my question to sabine how do you put all of that and make it voila a real system for management of the risk to the board by the board yeah, to make it on that short, you know, part of our as an internal auditor, we should have a look on that, how much, how often uh, that topic is presented um, in uh, the board. And I think, um, uh, Bernd, I think uh, you already said, you know, it's important that you even have a look as who is reporting to that. And we saw in the last year that it's normally it was clo very close to the IT managers or data protection managers. And I think it would be open even here to discuss it with the board. Is that the right form? Somebody from us, just uh, Philippe, I think he uh, mentioned the uh, CISO uh, sort of um, uh, for that organization, uh, an uh, CISO, an officer for that. Uh, even here, it should be carefully thought about that, whether it's whether from the size and from the risk perspective, it is okay that such an organization is hanging below the IT organization or the data protection organization, or depending on how you believe for your organization, how important it is and in your maturity development uh, model, whether it should be important that the guy is directly reporting to the uh, to the board members. So that should be a part of your assessment as well, I would see. Yeah, right. And and. OK, so we got the assessment, we got the system, you how would you imagine when do we have a call to action? You know, when all that should be actually moved into decision making and how to move into decision making? Um, what we uh, maybe uh, what we talked, I think, about the last time is when you had um, uh, uh, or what we had, especially if you have such a risk and you would like to have it as uh, 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 insured, right? You are sometimes having third parties looking at you and uh, trying that insurance companies are trying to ensure the risk of cyber risk attacks. And if you have such a company in house, they give you a quite good indication, right? Whether it's possible and whether your organization is capable and able, whether you can assure that. So that could even for the management board a good um, basic, I can say, for making decisions if you even that risk cannot ensure outside. Yeah, so that could be an indication whether you would uh, say there must be sort uh, of decision for changing your cyber risk or your uh, IT security organization. Should we also compare with other risk? And if all of a sudden cyber risk goes up, you know, then we, we do into more action. The question to you. Oh, Definitely. So if you compare that and you look at that, I think the um, uh, Bernd mentioned that as well, you know, you have that crisis moment and then you have it's more sometimes for some of the companies, it would be more business continuity uh, problem, right? Discontinuity. And if it rises up um, in that what we have seen in the risk and focus study as well, right? Um, that it's coming up and really jeopardizing your business. I think that is a form we would say you need to make a decision to set up such an organization. Okay. Well, all that makes sense. And again, you, as Ben mentioned, as you mentioned, the importance of call to action. Yeah. <laughs> Based on this system, because otherwise it's a great system, but it needs to lead to decision at the end of the day. Uh, 
Now we, we go into, if I may, the figures, the very interesting and beautiful figures, as some US politicians may say, uh, with regards to uh, how well does your board discuss cyber risk? And I must say, uh, to both my surprise and my interest, we do have a very different shape from uh, what we've seen in the previous one. Uh, so I'd be very interested to have a bit of your gut reaction or your know, esteem, est uh, analytical reactions to uh, what is just on screen, whoever wants to talk. Well, on, on my side, I was not expecting this result, to be honest. I was uh, expecting something more similar to the chart we had uh, on the previous question. So it looks, yeah, looks a bit uh, strange that the, the board with this level of crit criticity of the, uh, around the, the risk, criticality of the of the risk, and it's something which is also uh, applicable to many organizations. I'm, I'm surprised we are below three. That's uh, my takeaway. <laughs> any, any, any other thoughts? I would say I, uh, it confirms what Ben uh, Bernd was saying, you know, it's not EBIT, it's not financial figures. It's a new, uh, how can I say, it, 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 new scenarios where you need to think. And you see that here, the let's call it five, six years ago in internal audit, we had no clue about that cyber again, right? So we are building up knowledge. And I believe here in the management board, you see it as well that this kind of uh, management of this kind of risk, yeah, it's easy for financial figures, EBIT, Euro, you understand that, but here you have different scenarios. They are new and therefore I would say it's very fair from the group to say, I believe, no, they are not so as strong as it. There will be a development as well and we need that development that you can talk right about that form and understanding right. the risk. Quite good. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, definitely uh, more efforts to, to be done with regards to this uh, you know, system we mentioned with regards to boards and, and maybe other things with regards to boards. By the way, uh, as your know, time moves on, we have another 25 minutes together, but the last 10 minutes, let's put it this way, will be dedicated to questions. So feel free uh, as you listen to what has been discussed, uh, things you may agree, some things you may not agree, which is quite all right, evidently, uh, or questions you may have, you feel free to actually start your uh, laying out the questions and I guess then uh, Pascal at the end of our little session will be able to pull them out and we'll be able to ask them to our three distinguished guests. Now moving to a third important point again still in the very hierarchy that was designed defined in the hot topics for internal details documents I have this issue of the need to assess whether the information underlying the business financial calculation on assessing a potential loss from cyber risk are valid and accurate enough to support insurance claims. And perhaps let's broad, you know, let's put that a bit broader than just insurance claims, because at the end of the day, as we discussed just right now, figures and trends is the one thing that will get the most the attention of your bond members. And if by any chance you're able to really come up with the right figures. So then maybe you will hit directly into their heart. Uh, so uh, on that, we actually do have another Slido uh, question. And I don't know if, I don't know if Pascal, yeah, thank you, Pascal, if we can pull it up. And again, how well is your organization able to link cyber risk with business and financial impacts? Quite an interesting one, I would say. So, uh, well, uh, uh, oh. Maybe uh, let's start directly uh, with you, Sabine, because you did mention uh, some experience with insurance uh, people, which may be one way mm -hmm. to start assessing indeed the, 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 the issue of, of the financial impact. You know, what has been your, what's your personal take on that? What's your personal take on in general having third party guys trying to look at what's going on on this business and financial impact situation? As I said, I think I told already a couple of minutes again, I think I prefer that. Honestly, we started three, four, five uh, years ago in order you know, to make that visible, uh, having KPIs and figures, and then even our, uh, I call it the second line, right? The cyber risk organization tries that as well. But honestly, in the moment when you have some third parties, unbelievable, they get a little bit more attention. So I would say in that form, it supports, yeah, if especially insurance companies are flying in and saying, you know, um, 
because they are in that case saying, you know, what would be the price in order to uh, ensure your risk of cyber attacks? And then they are looking on the organization and then then, you know, depending on your organization, you are uh, you are uh, uh, it's possible to ensure you or not. And that I can tell you in the most even to my PSC in Germany when we talk, it helped in order to support that. So in that form, internally is what was quite challenging and uh, the support by an external, I think it helped very well. And if you have the chance, you know, I would say um, follow that. It helps. It helps. Very good. So we'll, we'll take on your advice, hopefully. Uh, but then beyond that, uh, are we already stuff? And I say stuff, I'm sorry for the very back term, but elements that we've seen in other areas of security of a company that can be used perhaps to try to assess those financial impacts and in general how could we start to do that and i i would turn to Bern perhaps if you had a few thoughts on on this important point yeah if you think about the business and the financial impacts i think um, usually many let's say figures frameworks already exist uh, within a company and uh, which should be used in the end for this for this type of, of exercise. And I think it's also important to use this information um, in the end to ensure also consistency across the different assessments, evaluations, uh, frameworks, however you call it. And I think one important source, for example, would be business impact assessments or another source would be, for example, uh, results from information protection assessments. So within information protection assessments, the protection need regarding confidentiality, integrity and availability of a process or an IT application is assessed. And this, of course, includes also the business impact and uh, the derived potential financial impact for, for the business. And um, if you think, for example, for a ransomware attack, um, then it can't be um, considered as a disaster. And um, this will be impact the availability of IT systems and by this of business processes. And um, from this business continuity functions uh, can be applied and then financial impacts can be uh, derived from this. And um, of course, it's not always easy um, because if information protection assessments, for example, are not available um, on an IT system level and subsystems are unavailable, so for example, um, ERP system, um, then it may be necessary to build up scenarios, make comparisons or um, mm -hmm. analogies. In the end, to, okay, yeah, so to calculate and to um, evaluate the business and financial impact. Right, so again, the taking back to the business impact assessment, uh, using the framework for information protection assessment, and as you mentioned, trying to you know, refer, for example, to ransomware as some sort of disaster, and then seeing whenever uh, IT is off, whatever other calculation are already done for other types of disasters that can actually, to some extent, be replicated when ransomware hits. That, 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 that's about correct, Bernd. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct, and and I think it's also important that is consistent because um, mm. if you should let's say um, underline an insurance claim and um, then um, the figures which are in the company, of course, should fit to each other. Correct, very important. All right, um, so we have a new Slido uh, actually uh, curve here as we ask a question. How well is your organization able to link cyber risk with business and financial impacts? We have 150 people again, so we do have a sizable, by the way, sample of people answering. Uh, and this time we have a different shape, which at some point was a bit bimodal to whatever uh, you know uh, reason it, it happened to be. Uh, maybe you does feel again that there is a bit of uh, you know lots of questions perhaps being asked you know, with regards to do i really am i really able to link cyber risk with business perhaps uh, i don't know what's your take on that uh, and and feel free jerome also if you have if that makes you react you know evidently to to uh, to to get on the on on the speaker's phone but uh, i don't know what what's your take what's your view on on what we see on the screen right here Maybe Sabine or Bernd. Well, um, if I see, I think it's um, it looks like that um, there is already, let's say, a mentionable 
um, link uh, between the um, uh, cyber risks in business and uh, financial impacts. And I could imagine that maybe um, having, for example, data privacy in mind that um, in the end, cyber risks, risks in data privacy are, um, let's say, there's quite um, related to each other. And by this, I think due to the regulatory requirements, maybe that um, the companies already did um, say um, many thoughts about the link of these risks and um, regarding what is the financial and the, the business impact if um, yeah, um, cyber risk or uh, data privacy, as an example, uh, would be violated. Okay, well, that does, does make sense. Uh, by the way, we, we, we have already a couple of questions, but again, you know, feel free to ask all the questions that you want to our distinguished guest here. I'm sure they'll be delighted to reply um, as we, we go forward. So we have two of the main points and then we'll move into the question time. Uh, I know there's already, again, I know there's already a couple of questions, but again, feel free. And that can be questions that can be also some sort of comments or rights reaction that would lead to questions evidently. This is a free space, so please feel free to use it. Uh, a fourth point, again, still in that prescription list, is the need to assess whether there was adequate recovery plans in place. A very mm. important one. And for that really critical question, maybe I'll ask uh, Jérôme, uh, what could be the main things to think about, uh, indeed, to assess whether adequate recovery plans are in place? Yeah, I, I think it's a critical point. Um, we, we, what we've been doing, at least it's my personal experience in the past, is to assess how the, uh, the, the, the strength, the robustness of the uh, architecture, architecture to avoid a cyber attack, right? It's, uh, it's rather to, uh, to try to close all the open doors to, uh, to, um, uh, to limit the vulnerabilities of our system. But it's not enough. The likelihood of being attacked is, is still high. It's, it, we, 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 we cannot put all the eggs on the same uh, countermeasure, I would say. It's also as important as uh, limiting the, the vulnerabilities to assess uh, the level of preparedness of the organization to recover from a, a cyber attack, from a, a, a cyber risk. And this is, this is critical. This is where I would uh, recommend or I would, I would mm -hmm. test on my side if the organization has made its own uh, assessment, uh, I would say, on the, on the key scenarios uh, which would have the highest business impact. And for those key risks, uh, I, would, I would imagine or I would hope as an uh, internal auditor that we have uh, a plan in place to, uh, to recover, a detailed one, some, something which would uh, tell us very uh, accurately uh, what we should focus on on priority uh, and what should be recovered uh, really uh, uh, more at the end of the, of the, of the crisis. So having a, a detailed plan is something which is critical and having this, this assessment and contributing to this assessment through the internal audit is something which to me is, is really key in this, uh, in the, in the current environment. Because once again, the likelihood of being attacked is, is high. Now, what I, the other element of pragmatic answers I would, I would like to, to, to share also with, with the forum is, uh, we should not have only and focus only on incident response, right? When are we going to recover this critical application uh, or list of critical application? It is a question mm. also in between how can we still run the operation with a pencil and a paper or a paperwork yeah. and for how long? So this needs to be also tackled in the business uh, continuity plan and not only focusing on what should be done to recover the application. Right. So again, have a plan, test the plan, I would say, and yep. test also what you mentioned was indeed extremely important. How do we operate when we are in a degraded mode and be very open that we will be in a degraded mode with pens, pen, pens and papers we've mentioned for some time. And that's a matter of fact. Uh, maybe, Bern, do you have additional elements, flavor, uh, details uh, to add to the points of Jerome? 
Well, yeah, Shero mentioned the topic um, recovery, and I think this is quite an important topic because um, for recovery, uh, on the one side, um, you have to um, to ensure that there is um, the critical dependencies are known and that you have redundancy from operational or geographical point of view. And of course, that you also make a regular um, um, uh, backup of your systems. And I think this is quite interesting because um, if you think of um, a ransomware attack, um, and um, your primary system is maybe encrypted and you have to make a restore from a backup system, then of course it has to be ensured that the backup systems are not affected by a ransomware attack. And um, this is, I think, quite quite important um, that there is a kind of independency of the backup systems so that they are available, that they work and um, that they can be used for a restoration um, in the case it is necessary. Yeah, you're absolutely right to restress the point of you need the you save the backup because if you don't have backup, what do you have? Key element here. Um, we may need we may move now to the, our last uh, you know bucket of questions before we actually ask our esteemed audience uh, you know whatever they are what are their own questions and again and I stress that again but you know, feel free. If you have any questions, comments, you again use that space to whatever is in the back of your mind that you're always afraid to ask. Now you can ask it, uh, and 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 I will ask myself. Okay, last two questions, put it this way. First, on and it's a kind of a general one, but then it's it's important to, to have it nailed down here. Uh, how do we actually, at the end of the day? You know, test all those security practices, patches, and procedures that need to be implemented consistently. You know, what should be the overall philosophy, approach, methodology? You know, to have this big bucket of thing. You know, that is done by other guys, but that the third line of defense need to control. Evidently, how does it need to be done? And for this big important question, I would actually ask Sabine if you had some thoughts on that. Hmm. Guys, yeah, thanks. Tia. Yeah. I think is one of the challenges, yeah, because if you look about your system landscape, it could be quite, quite big. So the point is here, what we should expect as an auditor is a really a structured approach. And firstly, yes, we will start with the policy. You know, not only that we take the policy, what is in out, even checking and making sure that we have all the uh, uh, practices and measures uh, that they are here because you even could say your policy is not enough. So start with that. Um, strongly, I would recommend, yeah, talk with the second line on that. Make sure that you're not making double work. Share that. On the other hand, be sure that you even can make self uh, pen testing, vulnerability scan, you know, and you don't need to have it like the second line, you know. Uh, in a very uh, systematic approach, but for once or two years, you can even check that for uh, that point. I think that would be in, um, important, especially as if you look all the uh, systems and the security measures like patches, uh, firewalls, DM set, the zones, segmentations, right? Uh, I would even see, and we see that in our company as well, it's sometimes quite investments in order to have that in a structural process rolled out across the company. So it means we need to uh, definitely understand uh, who is doing what. And um, if something is going wrong, like if you have a vulnerability scan and, you know, the guys are not reacting, what is the root cause behind that? Yeah, um, I would say uh, that is something what I would recommend, Guy. Well, fair enough. Thanks a lot for all these uh, uh, important uh, points. And then I will move to some of our last question. We talked about how do we do things internally. Now let's move into the third party supplier threat, uh, which is evolving, which is important, which is critical. And I would be very interested to have your views, Jerome, on how do we handle that as a third line of defense? Yeah, I think it's a it's a critical point to assess as well because mm -hmm. you can do plenty of good things internally with your organization. Nevertheless, can, the, the risk of cyber security can be brought by the third party and by the supplier. So it's a, also a key element to assess, and it's not easy. So you can really, uh, of course, uh, have a kind of process procedure to select the right vendors uh, in the criteria and the bidding process. It's also a question of having in place uh, good. Uh, 
clauses in your contract, uh, but it's it's also a question of bargaining power. Depending on the on the on the on the third party you have in front of uh, of uh, of you, uh, it's uh, maybe very difficult to impose your view and to get the the level of assurance that you would like from your uh, service provider because they are much larger organization than than your own organization. So negotiating, adapting their uh, standard uh, agreement uh, would be very difficult. Having a, a right to audit clause in their in their agreement would be very difficult to uh, to, uh, yes. to, uh, to consider. So yes, it is important. Now it's, to my view, something very difficult to, to put in place and to really ensure a kind of uh, uh, mm. mitigation of the risk. Okay, well, still, still, then, still a couple of things to think through to get those elements, uh, especially with regards to the issue of bargaining power. Thanks a lot for you know this coverage of all those main questions. But now we still have a few minutes, and I think we have actually a few questions that have been asked by the members of the audience. And for that, I will turn. Oh, I have it uh, actually on the screen. So I don't know, uh, um, uh, Pascal, if you want to say them out loud, or I can say them. Not a big deal. Well, go go ahead. Go ahead. I think it's easier. Sure. Okay, so well, you know, I'll, you have three questions. We have five minutes. I think that should do. Uh, so let's get going. So I'll start with the first one, uh, and that's actually a very interesting one, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, where should AI set the boundaries between line of defense two and three responsibilities regarding to cyber risks? Okay, and what should be the granularity of AI IT assets inventory? To me, this is a research question, by the way. Uh, a very interesting one, maybe for some other forums, but you're very interested to already have uh, some of the views by our distinguished guests. So who'd like to take a stab at that on AI? I would say uh, I can say it's the, the first question I had, because in the very beginning, if you are growing in your company, the maturity of the cyber risk organization is growing, that you're sometimes as internal audit, you are starting that. You are starting with a vulnerability scan, pen testing, and then if you're uh, uh, the second line is growing, they are taking over. And honestly, uh, so what is my answer? It's fluid, but in the moment the second line is growing, you should make a step back and making always clear, you know, you are making, um, you are collaborating, but when the moment is, you can still make a judgment about the second line, right? And it means, it means for working together, it's a very sensitive point because in the very beginning if you really would like to manage that risk you need to work together and on the other side you always need to make clear i'm not the guy who is responsible who is or who is uh, who is managing the cyber risk that is first and second line and to work on that i would say fluid fluid border carefully com uh, communication on that uh, so that you over the time when you are growing in that that you are carefully managing that is. Unfortunately, there's not clear cut, I would say. Bernd, you have there another insight about that? Yeah, so I think the same. So on the one side we have, I think um, it's in general, I think it's a development that mm -hmm. you have a, a stronger collaboration between the second and the third line. I think it's, it's important because I think uh, the, um, uh, company benefits from from this collaboration, but on the other side, um, exactly what you have uh, said, Sabine, um, I think it has to be absolutely clear who is responsible for mm. the operational doing, so that in the end, internal audit do not have the operational responsibility for for anything that they can do consultancy and um, if there are any questions to be discussed is absolutely fine, but it has to be clear who is in charge from organizational responsibility that is with the um, second and the, the first line and not within the, um, the mm. third line. This is quite, quite important. Jérôme, maybe you want to add something to that or, or we're going to the next questions? No, I'm, I'm fully aligned with what, what has been mentioned. I, I think the, the cooperation is really critical. We in our organization are meeting regularly with, with, the, uh, with the CISO, with the IT security team exchanging. Mm. It's really critical to, to also exchange on a regular basis. We, we have to, to be uh, united a, a, a bit in, in terms of uh, the ability to mitigate the risk. Now, uh, we are also uh, uh, here to provide uh, 
uh, I would say, an, an objective and independent assurance. So there is this check and balance also, which is our responsibility. And we have also to challenge the second line when we consider it's not going in the right direction or where they would put too, too much uh, responsibility, too many responsibilities on our shoulders. That's for sure. But that's the check and balance, which is true for cybersecurity, but would be true with, with many other risks. Huh? We have to cooperate, but also step back at some point in time and, and be more the challengers and, uh, than, than anything else. OK, so I'll just take blitz answers, really blitz answers. First one, where, when, where is enough software asset inventory considered completed? Blitz, blitz answers. Well, the, quite difficult to answer. Of course, it depends on the situation of the company. And I think it is quite important that um, you're not doing documentation for the documentation purpose. So um, that you um, have a granularity, which is really necessary for um, the management of the cyber risks, um, for example, so that you're able to analyze uh, which software component is affected by a vulnerability. And um, so I think the um, uh, Log4J crisis um, increased the need for a software bill of material. I think previously it was maybe was not seen as necessary um, as it is seen now. OK, and then final one, sorry, in just two words. <laughs> so be very <laughs> concise, precise. I know you can be. And this is the key one, actually. What do you see as the main obstacle hindering the board from fully discussing cybersecurity risks? Let's start with you, Jerome. I, I honestly, I don't see any main obstacle. There should not be any main obstacle to be sorry. I don't. I'm, to me, nothing. It must be discussed. It must be discussed. There shouldn't be. And but but then there seems to be something happening because we've seen the curve by that you know, some of our distinguished audience seem to have a bit of a problem. So maybe Sabine uh, Bernd, in just two words, what do you think is the main issue right now? Learning, learning and experience. They will learn it. Okay, so they will learn it, and then Bernd. And maybe um, awareness and um, let's say knowledge about cybersecurity. So that it is a, a topic where you're not very familiar maybe with, and um, by this um, you don't would like to discuss things where you are um, have only a few knowledge maybe. Okay, so here we have it. In absolute, they should know, and you're absolutely right, Jerome. Now it should be clear, and there's still somehow, as I understand from your answers in the learning curve, as by the way, we are all into in this very developing uh, environment, you know, and I refer actually to the AI questions guy, you didn't even throw the curve ball of unexplainable uh, AI, which will be another issue. Anyhow, uh, thanks to you all. I know, thanks a lot, uh, Sabine, Bernd, Jerome, and of course, all the audience for your active participation, for the quality of your answers. Uh, Pascal, maybe you want to have the last word. Thank you, everyone. Very interesting, insightful. So thank you for that. Thanks to you all. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Have a nice bye. day. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.